All right, uh, let us start the recording now. So I want to welcome everyone who is on the line with us or who will be at some point listening to this recording. Um, today is May uh, 1st, and we're so excited to have this time with John O'Hanifin, who I have the great pleasure to introduce. I'm Dorothy Saminovich, the host of the Awareness IQ series. And this is John, John O's being with us today is a great privilege and uh, very exciting. Uh, Jono has been uh, working as an OD consultant for 44 years, of which 43 of those years have been international. Uh, he's taught at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland, GIC, uh, starting in 1985, where he co-chaired the OSD program. OSD is known for Organization Systems and Development. In 1993, he co-founded the International OSD program with the late Edwin Nevis, Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Jordan, and Eva Furschland. And then in 2015, he co-founded iGold, which stands for the International Gestalt Organization and Leadership Development Program with Marianne Rainey, John Inkum, and Chantelle Wiley. Currently, he's co-chairing that program with Marianne Rainey. Jono is known far and wide in the OD community for so many consulting projects, but especially for having headed OD and executive development for Exxon and being the first facilitator for the very first Clinton Global Initiative programs, which has so impacted our world. I've known Jono for 30 years. And it's amazing, there's always been a buzz about Jono. Born in Ireland, he has the magic that what he says is often memorable in ways that surprise people. He embodies the stance uh, that, um, uh, that Ron Heifetz of Harvard, who wrote Adaptive Leadership, has made famous. Jono can elegantly provoke and disturb the client into awareness at a level that the client can tolerate and learn from. Indeed, I always think of Jono as one of the great awareness agents. A brilliant piece of thinking that Jono has made famous is his PWI concepts, which stands for Personal Weirdness Index. And it's a concept that people all around the globe have resonated to, the idea that each one of us is responsible for bringing our gifts to the world while managing our weirdness and recently, he's embraced the profound power of generating and maintaining joy. He is loyal to friends and family and currently lives in the Seattle area with his lovely wife, Julie, and their dear daughter, Brianna, who's attending college in LA. Jono has a lot of shine and I invite him to bring his light with us today. So with that, Jono, I turn to you and I say, welcome. Mm. Thank you very much, Dorothy. That's a lovely introduction. And I do feel the light and the shine because I'm sitting under spotlights here and I feel like I'm about to be interrogated uh, with the setting, but that's okay. I hope you can see me. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm in Burlington, Vermont today, and I'm pleased to say it's lovely, sunshiny Burlington, Vermont, because it hasn't been that way here apparently for a long time and i've been walking around a bunch of pretty depressed people for the last couple of days who are desperately waiting for the spring but it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, i appreciate those of you who joined live and also those of you who are joining uh, a little bit later on uh, to accommodate your schedule uh, we have a short time in some ways for me we could probably spend the week on this like most of the topics uh, in gestalt I, I'm aware that it's, uh, I can see like one or two of you, I can't see most of you, and I will give up my frustration of not being able to make visible contact with anyone but Christine and Zoltan um, for the sake of trying to just manage the complexity of, of the technology working. So uh, what I want to say about myself, and I'm, I uh, have a deck today. I wasn't sure I was going to have one. I decided to have one this morning. So I appreciate uh, Dorothy and Andrea's flexibility in uh, processing that for me. Um, and I just wasn't sure how I wanted to do it. So I have a lot of information. So I'm going to use the deck mostly to prompt myself. 
And also, just so you have something to take away, we can get it to you after, so you don't need to worry about uh, taking notes. What you should know about me, one of the things you should know about me, is I really do, I do love what I do. After all this time, I still love it every day, some days more than others. But I've uh, given myself permission the day that I stop loving it to stop doing it. I do coaching. I do a lot of CEO onboarding, particularly. Uh, I like catching people at the beginning. I love beginnings. Uh, I like catching people at the beginning of their assignments because it feels like more like a blank canvas. And uh, they're always looking for some help. And it feels like a good time to start a coaching relationship. I don't really do so much one-off coaching. I tend to do coaching in a system that I have a relationship with or with a person that I have a relationship who's asked me to do it. Um, and so sometimes I just turn it down and uh, give it to someone else. I find it takes almost the same amount of mind space to do a one-off, and it's just too much to carry for me. Uh, context matters, and so I'm always aware when I'm doing coaching of how, how to, that scene in the system that I'm in. There are some systems where, when, as you know, when you get a coach, it means you're in trouble. Uh, it's remedial. You're on probation. You've got 90 days to clean up your act or you're gone. Uh, so that's one kind of coaching. There's another kind of coaching, some systems, where if you're assigned a coach, it means you've been blessed. You're going to the top. And so they want to continue their investment. It's important to know which of those you're dealing with. I've been a Gestalt practitioner uh, since the 80s. Uh, Dorothy and I both did the OSD program in Cleveland, which I still think probably one of the most brilliantly designed development experiences I have ever come across. It was designed and created uh, by Elaine Kepner and Edwin Nevis and John Carter and Carolyn Lukensmeyer and Leonard Hirsch. Two of them are still around, John and Carolyn, and I, I just think what they do is brilliant, and it's gone on for a long time, and there have been other programs like IOSD and like iGold and like Dorothy's Coaching Workshop and a bunch of others that have sort of gone on uh, from that basic route, but I'm still very thankful for the founders for what they uh, created. And I was thinking, why am I doing this today? Well. I'm doing it because I love my craft uh, and I love teaching about my craft. And honestly, it's always been difficult for me to say no to Dorothy. Uh, so that's kind of why I'm here doing this today. So I have a deck that I'd like to go through and I would say anytime uh, you have a question or you wanna make an, a statement, please, uh, I think you can just put it in, and Dorothy's actually going to screen those for me, or more, more handle them, I would say, than screening. But she's being very supportive of me and not wanting me, me to be confused uh, with having to process those, so she's going to be handling those and sending them to me. So feel free anytime uh, you want to send something along. So let me start. Uh, so I, and I know some of you are on who are somewhat familiar. They're OSD people who I wish I could see, and IOSD people, and iGold people, and even people from Oxford just a few weeks ago. So I wish I could see all of you. And I will say up front, some of what you will see probably is gonna sound familiar, hopefully. Some of it I hope will be different. Um, and I'm reminded that as I said to a group in Oxford two weeks ago, I understood the uh, paradox, paradoxical theory of change for four years before I really understood the paradoxical theory of change. So uh, sometimes it helps, I think, to, to kind of uh, be recursive about this material. So if you're familiar, I'm sure, with the unit of work, simple model, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, I'm using that as my organizing principle. Uh, I, I think it's a way to organize a coaching session. It's a way to organize most things, even fairy tales. Once upon a time, blah, 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 they lived happily ever after. So my unit of work is a, just a little bit of an intro, and then I'm gonna actually frame the notion of instrument. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about principles, about using yourself and some examples. And I'm gonna spend a bit of time on how do you develop yourself as an instrument, and then a little bit of a summary. So hopefully that's what you've signed up for today. Okay, what are you doing? I have to tell you a story. About 25 or 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I did some work with a colleague of mine who's my BFF. 
we met in graduate school and then we went different ways. I went the Gestalt path and he went, I would say, more traditional consulting path. After that time, we got back together to work with a client and we work with a group. And by the way, I'm going to, uh, and when I explore the notion of use of self, I'm focusing on individual level and uh, coaching, but the principles are the same, the same at any level. We did our work. One of the things I said during the group uh, process that we were facilitating was, I'm really excited by what you're doing. They continued on. We took a break and he said to me, what are you doing? What do you mean? Why are you telling them that you're excited? What difference does that make? What does that have to do with our being facilitators? That for me was when I realized, wow, we've really gone in different directions. He was raised the more traditional, I would say almost Freudian, distant, objective, impersonal stance in facilitating a group. And I come up the uh, gestalt track about very much using yourself. At about the same time, I was doing some work in Australia uh, with an oil company and uh, I was doing an offsite and like senior teams do, they were looking at their vision statement. And in the middle of the process, one of the guys in the group says to me, Jono, what do you think of our vision? And I said, uh, it doesn't matter. No, no, no. What do you think of our vision? I said, it doesn't matter what I think. It's your vision. And he said, yeah, cut the consulting crap. Just tell me, like, what do you think of our vision? And I said, personally, I don't find it that exciting, you know, but that doesn't matter. It's yours. And so, uh, and with that, the CFO says, you know, it's funny you say that. I don't really find it that exciting either, but you know, I, I don't want to drag the team down. Well, one after the other, everyone in the group said, I don't, I don't find it that exciting, but I thought the CEO liked it. So this was the express train to Abilene. None of them liked it. And so that was another realization for me about, huh, what I matter, what I think and what I believe and what I carry actually can matter in the system. So those two things kind of made me realize um, that I'm a little different in this gestalt stance and that it has an impact. So a few things about instrument. Basically, an instrument is, a, is, a, is an implement, but especially for delicate work, so like surgeons and so on. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm working in the healthcare system these two days, so you'll excuse me if there's an abundance of medical metaphors that, that's just in the space for me. And so I think when you're in the moment, I think the moment's in you too. And so uh, I'm just very conscious of that metaphor. I believe you are the greatest tool that you have. Uh, I think about my daughter, Bree, that Dorothy mentioned. She's a musician in, uh, in LA going to college. And she plays the piano and the guitar a little bit, but her primary instrument, I believe, is her voice. And that's a little bit more personal, but I think uh, any instrument you use in your work is really quite personal. So a violin is a very personal thing to a violinist, which is a paraphrase of a Peter Vale piece of classic research about high-performing systems. I think his notion was a pole is a very personal thing to a pole vaulter. Uh, so it's, pers it's personal. Uh, I'm using the Clinton campaign model about it, the economy, stupid. And I would contrast that to the mafia model. Mafia model is, hey, it's business. It's not personal. You know, I'm going to whack you, but no offense. You know, it has nothing to do with you personally. So I think we have to accept the fact that uh, this is, for me, this is very personal. And I think you have to get to know uh, your instrument. And I mentioned, I think you also have to be aware of the, the orchestra in the context. And I talked about that, about how your organization views coaching. So my friend, my good friend, Annie McKee, uh, runs programs at Wharton and had me come in to the MBA program at Wharton and the PhD program to talk about executive presence. And what struck me was the first question in both groups was, what's the best kind of presence to have? Okay, so would anyone care to take a guess? How would you respond to that question? These are bright people, eager students, come to learn about executive presence. What's the best kind of presence to have? How would you answer them? Uh, if you want to type that in, feel free. But uh, the punchline is, uh, and, and maybe it's too quick to get some responses. Dorothy, you see anything? 
Hi, Jono. This is Jackie. I'm going to attempt. I Hi, Jackie. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm in Toronto. So Lucky you. My, uh, my rule is the best presence is to be yourself. Okay, so this session is about over or close. Yeah, that's it. It's yourself. And I, I, um, thank you, Jackie. And, but it's interesting to me that people were into, well, is, should I try to be like Mandela or, or like Bill Clinton or Oprah or no? Jackie says, it's yourself. Where that matters, I think, is because for me, it's about who you, being who you are and how you are and using that. It's not about how should I be as a coach and trying to become like somebody else is. And that really is the paradoxical theory of change. So to restate it, um, the, the, our belief is we develop by being more of who we are, not by trying to be different than who we are. So I think that's true for us as interveners. It's true for us as our clients. So I think a lot of our work is helping our coach ease become more of who they are. I was, I've been thinking lately about uh, coaching as a performance art. And the phrase authentic performance occurs to me. Uh, I think in this work, using ourselves, I think we have to be spontaneous, strategic, intentional at the same time. Some people might say, wait, how can you be authentic and intentional at the same time? Or, how can you be spontaneous and strategic at the same time? Well, it's a, they're great questions and, and it's a dilemma. And I think you actually can be uh, authentic and spontaneous and at the same time, intentional. I would encourage you to think about that. I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, I think the fact that you're intentional doesn't diminish at all that you're being authentic and whole. I also think about improvisation with intent kind of a performing art. I, Larry David, I'm a big Larry David fan, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Seinfeld. And the way Larry David shoots Curb Your Enthusiasm, he basically draws, uh, creates a one-page story arc, gives to the crew, the cast, and then each of them improvises their own dialogue. So there's no script. And I, I think for me, a lot of the work that we do in our coaching work is we have an intention coming in um, and we know where we're starting, but basically it's, it's improv. We're, we're working off of what's happening in the moment. Brenda Braxton was uh, a, an actress in one of my favorite Broadway shows, Smokey Joe's Cafe, which I think I saw either 19 or 20 times. Uh, and one thing she said is, don't let your audience seduce you or reduce you. So when you're performing on stage, you have to be connected to the audience, but in some ways you can't really be too directed. That was her perspective as an actor. I think as coaches, it's a little different. I think we are directed by where they are. We follow their energy and in some ways follow their music. Um, I've been thinking lately, we've been having some conversations, including with uh, Simone. I'm not sure if you're on Simone, but the idea that this, when, when you're coaching, or intervening in any way, there's no such thing as a wrong note. So the note that you play doesn't matter so much. What really matters is the, is the note you play next. And I, I think that's useful to keep in mind along with this idea of improvisation and playing live. What that requires is that we are really paying attention, that we're scanning, we're scanning our, our client, we're scanning ourselves, we're scanning the environment. Um, but I think it helps not to get too caught up in, wow, is this the right intervention at this time? I think it comes more out of us. You know, in Gestalt, we don't really teach interventions. There's the, the fixed model of the empty chair, but that really was an experiment that sort of got solidified. Uh, I think what we teach is a set of principles and then invite people to be inventive. So when you're coaching, you're really in the moment, you're really ad-libbing, you're really creating in the moment. Never doubt yourself. I came across this lately. I uh, was reading something about Michelle Pfeiffer. They had a reunion of the movie Scarface recently. And one of the things the director, Michelle Pfeiffer was kind of a relatively new actress. One of the things he said to her is performance coaching was never doubt yourself. 
And I think it's good to keep that in mind in doing the work. I'm going to say a little bit more about confidence in uh, doing the coaching work or intervening work in a minute, but never doubt yourself stayed with me. And everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, the wisdom of Mike Tyson. So I think we all approach the work with some idea of what's going to happen, but usually reality kind of intervenes and then we have to do something different. I would say about at least, 40% of the conversations I have with my clients, executive clients, they start by saying, I know we were going to talk about this today, but actually something came up and forget that. I want to talk about something different. So I think this really makes the case for being personally agile and being open and being in the moment and following the music that we are creating with our clients. I think this is a worthwhile question to consider. Why would anyone pay attention to you? I mean, this sort of speaks to your presence, but what is it you think you offer that would make someone pay attention to you? I want to try to get a, maybe a couple of quick responses to that. Why would anyone pay attention to you? Why do you think they would pay attention to you? Uh, so Patricia says, because I care. Hi, Patricia. Got it. Thank you. Why else would people pay attention to you? Uh, Harold Hill says, because I bring something that is missing and could support the movement of the work. Rihanna, like that age. Mm -hmm. Rihanna, Rihanna says, perceived expertise in a certain area. Mm -hmm. Claudia Renchi says, because I am present. Mm -hmm. Paul Cooper says, because I am listening and interested. And Ava says, if I listen and respond to something they say. Mm. Oh, great. I love all those. And they're all different. Um, and I think it's just, you know, you have your own answer to the question, but it speaks to some of the assumptions that you're making. And I'm going to suggest, I'll suggest it now, actually. One of the ways we develop ourselves is to keep challenging our assumptions. So as wonderful as all those answers are, I would say, and why else would people pay attention to you? There are a lot of reasons, and I think we have to have a sense of that uh, in doing our work so the client can be aware of the different sides of us that we bring. Let me say something about myself, uh, talking about use of self. Well, obviously, the prerequisite to, to using self is to be aware of self. Uh, and I think um, part of it for me is having some having a, as thorough and as deep and as colorful and as honest a sense of myself as possible so I can use those aspects of myself as a platform for intervening. So these are some things that occurred to me about me uh, that I know after this time. Uh, I have a sense of humor. I'm a good friend, as Dorothy kindly said. I'm mostly patient. Uh, I'm provocative. I like giving gifts. Uh, I like picking cards out. I like giving gifts. I'm marginal. You know, I, my dad used to say to me, you know, if you were a bird, you'd fly backwards. And uh, I remember a therapist saying to me one time, what do you get out of being different? And I, and I was like in my mid twenties and I said, I, I don't know, uh, why be like everybody else? Um, I love, I have an interesting relationship with complexity. I'm attract. I'm really drawn to it like a moth to a flame. Um, and at the same time, I, I think part of the value we can add as interveners is to cut through the complexity and provide some simplicity sometimes. I often think if I made business cards for the iGold or IOSD faculty, it would say, we, we simplify the complex and we complicate the simple. You know, I, and I think it's part of Harold's statement just now about providing something that's different. I'm a smart ass. You know, I, I own that. And I, and I use that sometimes. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm loving. I love irony and paradox. I just love the irony that people, you know, call us in to, to make some difference happen, whether it's individually as a coach or as in a group as an intervener. And the minute we walk in the door, they start resisting. Like you have to love that, uh, you know, to really, I think, appreciate the work. I'm aware that I'm much more approachable than I appear. I, I can use my Irish charm. I've been called cheeky since I was about four. Uh, I'm drawn to power and celebrity people. I just, something about the power and the light is kind of draws me as well. 
And I'm a chronic learner who gets high on insight. Uh, personal insight, I'm an introvert, so I spend a lot of time reflecting. And I love when I make connections and learn about myself. And I also love when I can facilitate insight on the part of my clients. I think as coaches, a lot of what we do uh, is stimulate uh, and provoke self-insight. I mean, we all have wisdom. We've been doing this for a while, but I learned a long time ago. People value the meaning they make out of things a lot more than they value ours. So I think we're sort of catalytic, uh, you know, in that way. So some examples of, oh, this is one, this is a unique bit of feedback I'll share with you. I'm not sure I've ever shared that with anybody. Um, you have a unique way of making, and I'm, the screen is blocking some of my uh, screen here. But uh, basically, making the connection between our small circles of life and the larger context in which we live with a way that enables people to think about it and make meaning of the world around them a little differently. Uh, this is feedback I got from Carolyn Lukensmeyer years ago. I, I'll tell you, and I'm going to suggest this at the end. I think it was on my 50th birthday. I decided to treat myself to some feedback. So I sent a note out. This is my gift to myself. I sent a note out to 25 of the, my most intimate acquaintances, family, friends, and I basically said to them, okay, you've known me 25, 30, 45 years. What stands out for you about me? And I got this wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful gift. And uh, so this was from Carolyn. It was a pretty special one for me. But I never thought about what she said. And ever since I got that information, it's been really useful to realize that's another way that I can kind of offer make a difference with myself and my presence just by being who I am with purpose. I think a lot of the, the point of use of self is really presence with intentionality. So some things about using yourself. I'm very conscious that the way we show up with our clients, we are actually modeling and teaching just in how we behave. Um, Harold and I had a little exchange about contracting just the other day. I'm not going to reveal anything, uh, Harold, because you didn't, we just, anyway, uh, it came up for us in conversation. But even in the process of doing our contracting, the way we do that is teaching and providing a model, a way of being for our clients. I have a, a client system that has a coaching program. Um, they kick it off in one evening and like, I don't know, 50 people come in with eight or nine coaches and they have a launch ceremony and then everybody goes off and does their own thing. It was the, the first night of that event. Uh, they were having a reception and uh, I'm on the line to get a glass of wine. And there's this woman standing next to me. And I said, you know, hi, how you doing? And she said, I'm good. And she re read my name tag and she said, so, oh, so you're a coach? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, good. And I said to her, so uh, what's your story? Like that. And she looked at me, she, she looked at me and went, I'm the CFO of this firm. And I said, ah, okay. And, and I would know that because, and she said, because, Oh, oh, I dropped my name tag. Okay. So now we're talking and I said, so how long have you been doing that? She goes, I started a month ago. And I said, really? So you don't have a name tag and you've been here a month and you expect that I would know who you are. I said, I bet you're going to have a real interesting entry into this system. <laughs> so Anyway, we chatted till the end of the line. We got up and got our wine, went down and had our meal. At the end of the meal, she came over to me and said, uh, would you be interested in helping coach me on my entry into the, like, you never know. I was just using my smart ass, smart alecky self. And I find for me, it's like using your humor. Uh, there's a sweet spot. You know, you want to be a bit provocative, but you always have to be respectful. And I just love finding, looking for the, it's sort of a high wire act sometimes, finding that sweet spot that is provocative, but still respectful and manages the boundary. Because I think we always have to manage the boundaries with the client system. So back to the Brian De Palma thing about never doubt yourself. Uh, as Dorothy mentioned, I was really honored to facilitate the first two uh, Clinton Global Initiatives. That's sort of gone off the track, I think, politically and that's sort of aside from what happened, but um, 
basically, I was new to this space. Bill Clinton was inviting a thousand CEOs, heads of state, NGO leaders, and global religious leaders to come together. I think he was his, his vision was. Davos was a chat fest, so he was going to invite these powerful people and told them to bring their checkbook. So I got asked to facilitate one of a group, small group of uh, 250. And um, I, this is a new space for me. I, I'm, maybe some of you work in the political arena. I don't usually. So uh, I was joining this crowd. There was, a, as you would imagine, a lot of preparation for this. I mean, months in advance. The level of detail that was, for me, excruciating and impressive. Uh, but I understand that these things are very staged and, you know, global leaders and so on. They need to be. Got on the first call and we were talking about the first session, which was entitled Islam and the West. And I was to be the moderator. And so I'm talking with all these politicos. So they talked for about 15 minutes and I said, I'm sorry, I feel a little uncomfortable with this topic. It seems kind of broad to me, Islam and the West. So I hear some like chuckling on the phone, like, <laughs> Okay, obviously this guy, he's a rookie. He doesn't know. He's, and we, they say, where do you, I said, I don't really work in the, yeah, yeah. You don't work in the space. It's obvious. Trust us. Just kind of follow along if you can. Okay, fine. Follow along. Go through the weeks of preparation. We have the first event. Kicks off. I'm facilitating the session. It starts off with the modern voice of God says, welcome. The first comment by the panel facilitator, who is the foreign minister of Turkey says, you know, before we start, I have to say, and he points to the banner behind him that says Islam in the West. He said, I really appreciate being here, but I have to say, the people that set this up have no idea, uh, you know, what you, to reduce Islam to a monolithic thing, you have no idea what you're dealing with. That was his opening comment. So my lesson from that is trust your instinct. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, but something felt to me off with the topic is too broad. I doubted myself. I, I sort of surrendered to those who do this all the time and kind of lost uh, lost a moment there, but I learned a lesson. I think uh, in part of using ourselves, I'm sure many of you do this. Um, I was thinking about me too, me too moments in a different way. And I realize using that phrase at this point is a bit provocative and I don't mean for it to be distracting, but I think me too means you ever work with a client and they tell you something and you say, oh, yeah, me too. I know what you're talking about. I've experienced that as well. That for me is a, is a way we use ourselves. Now, it's tricky uh, and I think it's helpful because it builds some trust. Uh, we are revealing with our client. I think that invites them to also be more comfortable being revealing with us. It makes them feel like we're not going to be so judgmental. But like everything else, um, you know, strength overdone. So I have a, a colleague who I suggested for a coaching assignment in an organization I was working with. He had been there about a month, and I met one of the women who uh, he was coaching. And I said, now, how's it going? And she said, oh, it's going great. Boy, that guy Mark, man, he really is interesting. He has such an interesting family, you know, and Mark was not his name, by the way. Uh, but it's like, he's fascinating. Like, it's just so interesting. I said, well, yeah, he's kind of really an interesting guy. So what are you learning in the coaching? And she says, uh, not really that much yet. But man, Mark is just so interesting. And I realized, okay, this is overdoing the, I can relate to what you're saying. Mark was actually looking, he took a statement that she'd make and use it as a springboard to talk about him. So those of you who've done some of our programs, you know that we talk about intervening. We say, get in and get out. Because uh, particularly in a group, you know, when you, when you intervene, you're interrupting. Uh, and you can't interrupt. You can't intervene without interrupting. But you want to get in and get out quickly. And I would say when you're coaching and you decide to use yourself, like, I know what you're talking about. I've been there myself. I would say, get in and get out and then get back to the client. So I don't think Mark was wrong by taking the attention. I think he was wrong by taking it for too long and not uh, putting it back to the client. So as I said, using yourself is about your presence uh, with intentionality. Sonia Nevis, who uh, Dorothy and I, she's a teacher of ours and, and I'm sure some of yours, 
Uh, I remember one time she gave some advice to a colleague of ours. I won't mention her name. Dorothy might be able to figure it out. She's a powerful woman who's a small of stature, I would say. And my nickname for her was the drill sergeant, but I won't say any more than that. And uh, one of her issues as a relatively small in size woman was having uh, establishing presence. Sonia suggested to her that the next time she goes into a new group, that one, she show up late to the meeting, and two, that she walk in and go up to the biggest guy in the room and say, I really need the seat, would you mind changing? And that's quite a provocative way to establish your presence, but I think that's part of what we have to do uh, in our work. So we want to, as, as Harold said earlier, we want to provide a presence that's different. So I think in terms of using ourselves, we got to be comfortable being different. Um, I think we can't only be different. We have to learn how to, otherwise we'd never join. But in some ways, from a Gestalt perspective, you can't really make contact with something unless it's different. So for me, as Dorothy mentioned, the perceived weirdness index is about being different enough to provide an interesting and a, a compelling presence, but not so different that the person just can't relate to you or the system sort of uh, you know, kind of kicks up its immune system and throws you out. So, Dorothy, are you reading something there? Did, did you get something in? A message or a question? I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm mute. I'm here. Yeah, Can you? Can. Yeah, I got you. Uh, so, Rihanna Moore has just uh, asked about personal weirdness index, and I think yeah. John if you uh, perceived weirdness index, if you say a little bit more how you use that, because this is your concept and everyone around the world is strengthened by it. Tell us more. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Rihanna. Um, perceived weirdness index. So, as I said, um, well, you know what? Churchill, uh, show me two men who think exactly alike and I'll show you one man I don't need. So to Harold's point, we have to provide something that's missing in the system. Well, missing by definition, that's our stance around presence. Missing means we got to provide something that's different. Um, so I find, for instance, these days, a lot of, a lot of the organizational systems I'm in, what's missing is pace. They go at a warp speed and they value speed. Um, and they don't really value slowing things down. They don't really value reflection. So sometimes I will come in and if a group is going too quickly, part of what I am trying to do is slow them down. Simply because I think the faster that we go, the more we're doomed to behave the same way. You know, and as Dorothy's whole mantra is about awareness, if, we, if we're not aware, and I don't think we are aware if we're on autopilot, without awareness, we really have no choice. We can't, I can't choose to behave differently. So if someone you're coaching, um, I think part of the goal in a lot of coaching sessions is give our coaches some options, some different ways of behaving. You know, I think a lot of the development stance from a Gestalt perspective, it's part of the paradoxical theory of change, is to give people more range. Um, so I just got off a call early this morning, and that's exactly the task. Uh, the guy was telling me how he responds to someone who's an adversary and he's not getting anywhere. And I said to him, Steve, you need to take the range of responses you have in response to her and expand them. So you need to be more of how you are. That's how you'll wind up being different. Uh, so I realize, though, that we want to be different. But if we're too different, I think people can't take us in. So the, the challenge is, how can you be different? but similar enough to still be bounded in by the organization or by the person and not activate the immune system that kicks you out. And I learned that in my first job at IBM where I worked in the computer room when I was 19 and I worked on the second shift and one evening these behavioral sciences guys, they were newfangled at the time, came around to do an opinion survey and they came to present the results. And in 1970, three IBM, uh, the, the costume was uh, a dark blue or gray pinstripe suit with a white shirt and the striped tie and 14 pound blank, black wingtip shoes. 
That was the dress. These guys, this guy came in with a turtleneck shirt, a big peace medallion, sandals, and he, and he walked in. And you know what? I, I don't remember what the heck the guy talked about. All I remember is when we had a break, those of us that worked in the computer room, all we could talk about is the way this guy dressed. And we didn't even hear what he had to say. So the point is, find that sweet spot where you're different enough to be interesting, um, but not so, if you're too different, then what people focus on is how different you are, not your point of view or not what you're advocating. So thanks for the question, Rihanna, but that's what it means to me. And I love balancing that space. And sometimes I go too far on the other end. Um, if you're not different enough, um, and I, you know, I, I think you run the risk of blending into the wallpaper or the carpet and you don't even have any presence. And if you're too different, I think, uh, that stands out and people can't quite connect. So I think it's, what's different about it is, is what makes us interesting. But I think in terms of developing ourselves as instrument, we have to be comfortable being different. Uh, and if we are different for whatever reason, we have to be comfortable being able to join. I know a lot of people in our work who are really good at differentiating themselves and I find are really challenged to join. So interested, by the way, I think is interesting. So, you know, in our coaching work, the, most, the thing that makes me the most interesting, I think, to my clients is that I'm actually interested in them. Um, you know, every person a novel. If you don't find your client interesting, you gotta find something about them that's interesting. I can think I, you should find I, another. Can I interrupt yeah. you for a moment? You're doing, you're Please. doing very, uh, so I don't know if I'm saying this. Letha Geza says, how do you see yourself when you are too different? And Rihanna says um, something about when you're too different and that, how do you recognize when you're too different and that you can actually get unused or kicked out? How do you hmm. see that moment? The moment when you're too, I, I got Rihanna's, what was Letha's one about the same? How do you again, Dorothy? Yeah. So Letha Giza says, how do you see that you are too different? How do you manage that moment of being too different? And Rihanna says, and when you're too different, you know, you could really be in jeopardy. How do you manage that moment? Keep them interested, but recognize that moment of being too different. And how do you self-regulate that moment? Yeah. Great questions. I don't think it's always visible. I mean, sometimes you can. You can see a physical reaction. Uh, Sometimes it's dress, uh, something as obvious as that. You walk into a room and everyone is dressed one way and you're dressed another way. You know, so, um, you know, if you're working at a bank, a lot of banks, and you walk in with jeans and sandals or, you know, flip-flops, you, it's obvious that you're different. Or, by the same token, you know, apparently you can't work at Google if you go in with a suit. You know, they throw you out. So you have to match. Uh, and, and I think the dress is an obvious example, but I think a lot of differences are really not, to, to your point, not evident. Uh, different ways of thinking, different mindsets, different values. You know, it's easy to see, uh, wow, I'm the only guy in a room of females. Um, it's harder to see that, wow, these people really think in a linear way. And I'm talking about their thinking systemically. And, and I can maybe interpret that by the, the glare on their face uh, when I, they respond to what I'm saying. Sometimes if I'm not sure, I will speak to it. I will uh, address it. I will talk about uh, being different or feeling different. I will use myself that way to say, geez, I feel different in here because of whatever. Um, I've actually done that also with a group of white males 14 white males and me. And one of the things I said wasn't really that I was different. I think I was a little different from them in that I was aware that we were 14 white males in a, in a room. And so I differentiated myself by saying, huh, I'm aware that we're 14 white guys in the room. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that was my way of kind of heightening their awareness about what looked obvious, but I was trying to make some differentiation out of it. But I think a lot of the time those are good questions because you don't really know until you poke around a little bit about what's different. You can always ask, um, you know, use your curiosity to say, I wonder what the differences are in here. Um, so sometimes when it's not evident, and I, and I think when you do it long enough, you can kind of 
maybe pickups. Sometimes I don't even know what the cue is, but I have an intuitive sense by people's reaction that they're not quite with me. So I will stop and pause and test in some way to see what people are picking up. So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but that's the best I have at the moment. I will cook it on the back burner uh, while we're doing this. I, I like those questions though. How do you how do you deal with that moment? I find that moment, by the way, a very exciting moment uh, because there's a lot a lot more energy in difference. I think, which is why I think difference is the only source of creativity an organization has. I mean, I mean, if it's all similar, I think people feel good and they feel safe and so on. But there's no spark, and I think uh, I think Gestalt is very much based on you can only make contact with something that's different. So while difference isn't a guarantee that you have creativity, I think it's necessary. I think it depends how you manage the difference is really the issue for me. And I think resistance is a difference too. And I think, you know, keeping with the Gestalt stance, I would say part of using ourselves is to go with the resistance. I had a uh, coaching assignment. It's another one of these programmatic things at a brokerage firm. And I went in and I think I had six or seven coaches I was meeting and I met this one guy and I'm introducing we're just getting started and he's you know around like oh man so um I said I notice you're, you're you seem you're fidgeting and you're like you're not making much eye contact and I said like what's what's going on and he said I don't really want to do this I don't really want to coach you know I don't need a coach I got to do it because everybody at my level has to do it or you can't move ahead. So I'm basically punching my ticket. So it's like, Hey, I'm happy to listen to you, but I don't, I'll, I'll play along, but I don't really need this. So I said to him, Oh, that's interesting. So I said, well, huh. I said, well, that sounds like it's going it to it be a waste of your time. He said, yeah, it probably is. I said, well, yeah, it'd be a waste of my time too. Then um, I said, I'll tell you what, 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 if, what if you just, let's both just say, you know what? We don't want to do this. And he kind of sat up and he looked at me for the first time and he's like, what? Why don't we just tell the people that are managing the program that neither of us really wants to do this and just take us out of the thing. Now, now he's, well, he's like, no, well, you can't really do that uh, because that will reflect badly. I mean, so now we start talking about really, so do you go along much uh, in, in your experience in this company? Do you go along with a lot of things you don't agree with because it's what you need to advance? And off we go on a conversation. So I basically just leaned into, oh, let's not do this and kind of exaggerated it to let's get official about it. So that's an example for me about how to use yourself to work with the resistance. I do want to be clear also about the difference between therapy and coaching. Many of us know the difference. Not all of us do. Uh, and I think it's an important difference to, to have. Uh, there's a handout I'd be glad to send along. Uh, uh, I think on the IOSD faculty at one point, we, we did a handout on the difference between the two, therapy and coaching. And, um, you know, people who are not used to this, uh, you know, it, they think they don't know. Clients often don't know, and they will, they'll talk about my therapist or my psychiatrist. And I think it's one thing to tease about the language, but I think it's important to be different. We're there as coaches. Uh, we're not in a therapeutic relationship. And I, as I said, I'll, we'll send that along the after, but important to know the difference. Um, and by the way, you know, I think just like in our work, it's the same thing at an individual level as in a group, you know, whenever you say this, oftentimes you know, when you say in a system, how do you feel about something? People will say, ah, oh, okay. It's time for kumbaya. Okay. Let's everybody gather around. They're not used to that. So that's what they, they move to that, you know, that sort of fear. I think individually people are afraid of being, uh, having a therapist and we're clearly not therapists or coach. I would also say some of the coaching that we do, that I do, it's not really officially coaching. Uh, um, the next point about, and, and I think actually every encounter we have with someone in a system is a coaching opportunity. And I think of it the same way. It drives me crazy when leaders say, I don't, I'm too busy. I don't really have time to develop my people because I have too much work to do. So I, always, I, I try to get them to reframe that and say to them, you know what, every encounter you have with one of your people, whether you're giving them a direction or feedback, it's, every one of those is a coaching opportunity, whether you think of it that way or not. I suggest you think about it as a coaching. Then it's not something you, where well, you work and then you stop and you coach. I think you coach while you're working. It, I think for a lot of leaders, it helps them realize, yeah, 
you don't have to polarize that. And I think about that as well. And um, I, I can recall a CEO I was working with, I was making a pitch actually for a leadership development program. And this guy had a reputation, people were frightened of him. He ruled by fear. He kind of insulted people in public, not really pleasant, but he's very effective as a CEO. And I'm meeting with him, this is the third time with the HR guy there. And I stopped in the middle and I said, um, Bill, not his name, can I ask you a personal question? And he goes, yeah, but I might not answer it. And I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, and I, now I notice the HR guy is, He's got sweat on his brow because he doesn't know what I'm going to say. And I said, I love that you're really interested uh, in this leadership development thing. But honestly, I have never worked with a CEO who has gotten into this level of detail. I mean, we were practically talking about is the coffee break at 10 or 10.15 on Tuesday? You know, it's that kind of detail. And um, I'm saying, so like, it's unusual for me, but so what will it take for you to feel comfortable with this? Again, with the arms, and he said, I'll be comfortable when I'm comfortable. I said, okay, that's fine. But I made my point, um, and I, I was establishing my presence in doing that. I pushed back on him. I did it very respectfully. Uh, I'm always respectful that way when uh, their staff is around. It's a little different for me one-on-one, -on -one, but I think you always have to maintain face. So, the, and the conversation continued on. And the next day, uh, I got a call from the HR guy saying, okay, you know, we're ready to go. So just that push, I think, established my presence. I think even though he didn't like it, he didn't like being pushed back, I think he reluctantly respected that he could trust me to at least push when things weren't quite right. So uh, I think that's part of how we use ourselves. I'm thinking lately, too, about how we use our language. So coaching therapy is one piece of language. But, and I'm not just necessarily talking about a book. Darcy's got a great one, by the way. If you haven't seen that, you really, it's a must have. Um, but I'm noticing how even in our correspondence to our clients, emails, notes, I'm getting much more particular about the language I use because I think that's another way we use ourselves. You can be provocative with language. You can be supportive with language. You can challenge with language. So I would say this is another way. Pay more attention to the language you choose to use uh, in your work John, in every instance. John, yeah. quick. Uh, Thank you, Dorothy. No, no, it's so important moment. Claudia Renchi is asking, even though uh, you're going to send a follow-up about the difference between therapy and coaching, if you have any just tips or guidelines about how you differentiate, because you get in so deeply, and that's your style to really get in and get out, but how do you know this is a, a, a therapy moment, this is still within the realm of coaching? Could you give some light? Yeah, okay, thanks, uh, Claudia, that's a great question. Uh, and I will say, um, if, you, if you took a sliver of an interaction between a coach and a coachee, sometimes, if you just took like a maybe a two minute clip, I think there are times you actually could not tell the difference just from the interaction. The, inter the difference for me is the context. I'm really clear I'm coaching. I'm clear I'm not a therapist. There's a power difference. Uh, clearly the therapist is in a one-up position. Uh, they're not trying to bond with me in the same way that a coach would. Therapists may or may not use their own experience uh, as an illustration because they're not, it's a different kind of relationship. So I'm clear there's a power imbalance. Oftentimes, uh, maybe both of them are actually paid for by a client. But um, what matters to me is like it's interesting that you hate your mother. I'm not interested in why you hate her. I'll leave that to a therapist. What I'm interested in is how does the fact that you hate your mother play out in how you do yourself as a leader? So uh, that's one of the differences for me. And, you know, there's a notion I'm, I'm very, I'm a pragmatist in this work. I think uh, the why is interesting a lot of the time, um, but it's sometimes it's the booby prize. I think from a Gestalt perspective, the how 
is more useful for us. So how does this block you? How does the fact that you are an oldest child, like myself, who takes an enormous responsibility and has difficulty asking for help, how does that impact the way you work with the people you work with? Um, and I'm not necessarily going to go down the path of, you know, did you feel like you, did you resent your peers who were younger because they got away with everything? And that's a different conversation. So it's a good question. I, there's a lot more delineation, but for that, for now, I'd say those are two of the things that uh, occurred to me, power imbalance and why versus how. Um, I also want to, truth to, I'm, some of you, I'm sure coach powerful people. I'm always aware of the challenge in, in speaking truth to power. Sometimes as coaches, we're the only ones that can do that. Um, and I'm aware myself, I have to constantly pay attention to the trappings of power uh, and not to get too swept up in the fact that everyone else is bowing down or um, there are three levels of uh, um, gate guards to get through before you get to your client. So I'm aware of those things. I actually, myself, I kind of, um, I try to be a little dismissive in the sense of not letting it bother me. I'm always respectful, but I, it, it's really important not to get too swept up in, you know, if Anne is your client and she's a hotshot executive and you're meeting her today and you walk in and you say, I'm here to see Anne and people say, oh, Anne, oh, you're here to see Anne? You know, it, it, you pick up, it's very easy to pick up the kind of uh, intrinsic um, intimidation that's in the environment. I think we have to be aware that we don't absorb that and keep ourselves in a place where, you know, we could say to the CEO just as easily as we could to a first line supervisor, hey, with all due respect, you know, let me push back. I find that, by the way, that language is very helpful uh, when I say to people, either I say, look, I'm gonna push back on you, is that okay? So I'm getting their permission. So it's not disrespectful or it seems to me if you use this language of uh, kind of West Wing language of, hey, with all due respect, you could basically say, you know, hey, with all due respect, I think you're a jerk and you're adding no value. You know, not quite, but um, you, seem to, you buy yourself a lot of room, I think, with that phrase of uh, with all due respect. So um, self is instrument. OK, so. What, how do we develop ourselves and what's the work that we have to do to develop ourselves as uh, agents of change and catalysts uh, and interveners with the people that we coach? First off, I would say for me, it's about developing ourselves as whole people. This is the paradoxical theory. So anything you do to be more of who you are, not different than who you are. Uh, back to Jackie's response at the beginning, it's about you. You know, you're, you are the right style. And I, as I remind my daughter, Bree, regularly, uh, we're not meant to be perfect. We're meant to be whole. So I think we have to own kind of our wholeness, including our imperfections. And I would say even go beyond owning it and find a way to use it. Uh, I think developing ourselves is about expanding our range, which means extending our boundaries. I think we do that by experimenting. The metaphor for me is, you know, could you play a round of golf with one club? You could. Uh, you know, you can play with a seven iron. If you're me, it's not going to make that much difference to your game. But if you play, you're probably going to be better off if you have 14 clubs to choose from for a shot. So to me, it's about putting, you know, arrows in the quiver or clubs in the bag, whichever uh, you prefer. I think a de another development test for us is to notice what you notice and notice what you don't. That's hard to notice what you don't notice. So I think it helps if you talk to other people. But you know, when you when you sit down and you start with a client, what do you pay attention to? Do you have a fixed, you know, do you use a classic model to scan the unit of work or the person? Or do you sort of, you know, can you balance that with going in and just paying attention to what gets your attention? If you do that and you notice, gee, the last nine out of the last 10 times, what got my attention with the client was the way they dress or their accent. I'd say you have to challenge yourself you may be getting fixed. There may be some lenses that are too predominant and you need to develop other ones. You can learn those by talking to colleagues, I think, and seeing what they do. We have biases. We have blind spots. I think we have to be aware of them. And I don't say get rid of your biases because the paradoxical theory says for me, 
keep start with where you are who you are and how you are got you here so i think you keep that but you just supplement and expand because i think when you say to people look you need to be different than who you are you really just heighten resistance because we're using ourselves i would actually say personal development is professional development uh, anything you do to develop yourself personally getting in shape do different kind of reading interact with different social groups for me supports us professionally so uh, there's a notion of apperceptive mass it's the ground of all of our experience i would actually say living life fully is a professional development strategy you know i like musical theater i like ice hockey I like whatever it is. I like wine. Whatever it is you like, the more things you are exposed to, I think you have a more fertile area from which to draw metaphors and from which to connect with the, the people you're coaching. Uh, so think about everything you do. Anything, anytime you do anything that's different in your life, I would say that's a development uh, experience and development opportunity. I would also say, look, we all have our own stories. Uh, those of you on the call who were in Cape Town, you will remember this January at the uh, alumni meeting, you'll recall Peter Block, you know, was talking about rewrite the narrative. It got me thinking about that. We really have our stories and we get stuck with our stories. And sometimes they're useful and sometimes they're not. Uh, so those of you who are more on the clinical side, you know, will recognize uh, Milton Erickson, you know, who said, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. You know, so there's always a chance to recast the, the story of your life. And sometimes that's one way to shift uh, patterns and kind of um, themes and so on. So I would say, you know, and, and, you know, from a Gestalt perspective, all boundaries are arbitrary. So the meaning that you make out of anything is arbitrary. So just like, you know, when we do the iGold program or the IOSD program, we say collect data in your client individual or group organization, come up with an assessment and then go back and using exactly the same data, come up with two or three more assessments. It's a way to sort of stay fresh, I think, and agile. I would say the same with our own lives. It's useful to go back and maybe rewrite um, the narrative. I also would say we need to be more aware to develop ourselves as interveners. We have to challenge our own beliefs and assumptions, you know, so Possibility mindset. I'm thinking about that lately. Like, what do you think you could possibly accomplish in a five minute coaching session? Do you think it's possible to have a significant impact on someone in a five minute coaching session? If you don't think it's possible, I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen. If you think it's possible, I think it opens up other possibilities and it, it, it might happen. I, I think, what are your assumptions about what it takes to be influential? And uh, here I will pause and uh, smilingly acknowledge our late colleague, Ed Nevis, who used to tell this wonderful story about grammar school, where he went in into his first class on Shakespeare. Dorothy, you, you may remember this. And he talked about the teacher, Miss Shirley. And she put the first day of class, she put the chair on the desk and started reading from the first act of Macbeth, when the witches are talking. And he said from that moment on, he just fell in love with Shakespeare and theater. Who knew that this you know, woman in public school in Brooklyn, standing up on a desk, was gonna impact a student for a life? So like, you never know. And one of my beliefs, by the way, that I uh, would share with you is, I work from the assumption, most of the executives I work with, they're smart, and a lot of them need to be the smartest person in the room. So I always make the assumption uh, that executives love to learn, but they hate to be taught. So for me, the task in coaching and teaching is sort of sneak in the learning. Uh, and I often say things like, ah, okay. you, you probably know, I'm, I know you know this, but let me say it anyway. I know half of them don't know it, but it, it allows them a little space to be able to sort of take it in. And I also would say part of the challenge is we're all evocative, you know, back to the presence question. I heard someone say last week, well, I think I have presence. I think you have presence. We all have presence. You know, you have presence whether you're aware of it or not. And you have, your, your presence has an impact whether you're aware of it or not. So you evoke what you evoke. It's good to get some feedback, by the way, on what do you evoke. What gets stirred up in people just because you show up? You don't even have to do anything. That'd be good data to have. 
some of us have been through an activity where we've gotten some of that. But I think if you sprinkle some boldness on that, I think, and stretch a little bit more to be a little more provocative, I think that helps expand uh, your range. I would encourage you, as I did, to uh, this exercise about contact people who know you and say, hey, what stands out for you about me? That's a way to find out something about yourself that you may be not seeing. Uh, and I would say building your confidence. I go back to John Weir, for those of you who know him, who was um, uh, a wizard, I think, in the personal growth movement, who basically said, do yourself with confidence. You know, uh, do yourself with conviction, rather. I think that's part of building confidence. And that's not arrogance. I think, you know, for me, the bottom line here, why should I be doing this work? When you have doubts, just, just remember, you're the best one to do this coaching work because you're the only one in the room with them at the moment. So if for no other reason, you know, you're the best one. And I think, you know, with, you, I, with some humility and that keeps us from being arrogant, I think assume you're on the right path. And if you get some data back that says you might be off, then you just change. I don't think we don't get too attached to the outcome. So summary, I can see we're running out of time. I'll leave some time for some comments and questions. Uh, okay, obviously, awareness of self is a prerequisite for use of self. And I think use of self is about presence, which is kind of easy. Uh, it's deceptive, I think, on some of our programs. I, I've confessed to the class. My fear is that what people take away from Gestalt is you just have to show up. No. Uh, it, it's actually that you have to show up fully. That's the hard part. Bring all of yourself. Bring your sense of humor. Bring your wisdom. Bring your insight. Bring your irreverence. Bring your reverence. Bring it all and kind of. So I think we have to be all in. It's the intentionality part, being present with intentionality that I have to say I find exhausting. Uh, I know sometimes my presence is sort of zen-like is the feedback I get. I'm still, I'm calm, but you know, under the surface, I'm the duck and I'm, I'm, I'm hustling. I'm going through our mantra for intervention. I'm tracking all these things that I'm aware of. I'm choosing something to focus on. Um, I would also would say, I hope, some of you do this. I got a feeling most of you do this better than I do or many others do at times. But if you think about yourself as instrument, you have to maintain the equipment. You have to do preventive maintenance. You know, there's a, a Buddhist expression I love about you can't pour from an empty cup. So in a lot of ways, the care that you provide to your client, you have to take care of yourself, which for me, it, it allows you to be helpful to others. And I think that's what's selfless about it. I also believe, by the way, you can't do for other people what you are unable to do for yourself. So if we don't, if we're not comfortable dealing with conflict, if we're not comfortable dealing with intimacy, if we're not comfortable, then it, I think it gets in the way and it keeps us from being able to share that uh, with clients. And uh, it's all about, in some ways, use, using yourself in the work. It's all about you. All these things you have to keep track of, the choices you have to make. And at the same time, it's not about you. It's not about us. It's about the client. You know, how do we support them? So I love that paradox about the work. See, I told you, this is the influence of the medical model. So I'm no healer. Uh, intervene or know thyself would be my closing um, comment. So, um, well, I don't know what that was like for you, but it's fun. It was fun for me. I'd love to hear something back. Uh, what stands out for you, having heard all of this? Um, yeah, and thank you for your kind attention. And I would welcome some, some feedback. What of all of that uh, is standing out for you at this moment? Dorothy, you're muted. Yeah. Which is a word I would never use to describe you. That was cute. Uh, yeah. What we can do is unmute everybody and uh, just have a self-regulated so you could hear your voices and be more in contact. Oh, I'd love it. It'd be great. Okay. Sharifa just said, you, Jada, that you make it all sound so easy. Sharifa of the, of the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Jonah. It's not. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I take that as a compliment because I think in our work, if we're natural and integrated, and it ought to appear easy, but I don't know about you, but it never is for me. I'm always working, but thank you for the observation. Definitely a compliment. Thank you. 
Well, I'm Eva here. I'm sorry I'm not on camera because I have glued my camera on my computer because of other activities. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I want to say thank you for the session. I was wondering what a gestalt, gestalt session with Zoom would be like. And now yeah. I know a little bit more. Uh, my, I had a question or thoughts around this, never doubt yourself, because it's linked to pace. You like speak very pace. quickly, yeah, you speak very quickly, and uh, depending on which cultural context you are, maybe sometimes it's good to doubt yourself whether you have really uh, understood things the right way. Yeah, um, I, I get that. Um, I doubt myself all the time. Uh, and, and I think part of using ourselves is if I doubt myself, I will try to use that in the work. So I will say, uh, I'm not really sure what's the best thing to do next. And you know what? Every time I've ever done that, the client says, well, we could do this. Okay, fine. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. And by the way, I was very aware of you, Ava, last week uh, at the Korean summit. And uh, I'm glad that seems to have worked out well so i don't know how you use yourself in the north but um i'm I was just pleased for all of us but i was particularly thinking of you um yeah so I, and i mean doubt yourself in the sense of don't let it stop you it's like ah, eh, you you doubt yourself be aware that you doubt yourself and then go ahead and try something and see what happens and again back to the point of it doesn't have to be the right thing it just has to be the next thing uh, and as simone said with his um uh, quote about, then just pay attention to what happens and then do something else. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, the same. So just so you know, I interpret the silence as silence. Okay, so it's Jackie. I don't make any other meaning out of it. Hi, Jackie. Jack, it's Jackie. Can yeah. I can I make some observation? Please. So I learned two really big insights today. One is actually I can use my nature of being cooperative as my ass and cheeky. For a little while I was being educated to refrain from being cooperative because a coach is supposed to be humble. So I wasn't quite myself. When I look at you and yeah. hear what you say, then suddenly I realized that, okay, I can be myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. <laughs> the, the only thing is really I will have to do a lot of experiment in order yeah. to find the sweet spot between being yeah. different enough and being still similar yeah. enough to, to stay in the system. Because yeah. being coach, exact coach can not bother you. Yeah. So that's so now my second observation is actually about this morning I was scratching my head. Okay, I'm going to launch on my journey to start my practice. Where am I going to market myself? And I can talk about all this cocktail and just talking to people. I always go to conferences and these are places where I'm going to be different and provocative and find someone. Yeah. So thank you for the marketing insight also. Hmm. You're very welcome. If I could give you anything, if I could do anything with this call, it, what you just suggested to me is probably the most powerful thing I could do. Basically, give you give you permission to be yourself, which, as you're saying, only you can do. And it sounds like you're giving yourself permission to be yourself fully. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, so. But for some time, I was so totally confused about, oh, you don't have humility. Humility is your yeah. lowest, yeah. real strength, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So now I feel free. I found a new form of Good. freedom. Thank you so much, Jonas. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I think we've come with all the parts. We all have humility. We all, we all, we're all provocative. We're all irreverent. We're all anything we can imagine. It's just a matter of getting out of our way and giving ourselves permission to use all of those things in the work that we do, or just in being. I think just being yourself fully in anything you do is also a marketing strategy in a way. People get drawn to to your presence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, hi, John. It's Lita here. Hi, Lita. Hi. Um, I, I also have a couple of takeaways. I think the first one, when you mentioned that you, it's important to know which coaching you are dealing with. I think that yeah. that was kind of like profound. Well, sometimes we approach coaching, you know, um, I mean, the same way without necessarily, I mean, understanding yeah. what coaching you're dealing with. And I think um, that's one of the things that I learned also today. And, and, and then when you also said that there's no such thing as a wrong note, and I want you to kind of like, as you close, talk more. When you say that the note you play doesn't matter, but what matters is the note you're going to play next. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you mean by that? What did you mean exactly by that? Um, for me, it, uh, it means don't get too worried about whether you have the right intervention. Mm -hmm. I would say take all the information that you have at the moment and do your best to come up with what you think or what feels like the right intervention. Do it uh, and be less interested in whether it was the right one and more interested yeah. in what happens after you do it because that will inform the next note, the next thing that you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does that help? That, I get you. I get you. Thank you. It's, uh, for me, it's more of an uh, externalizing. Like, don't sit and think about it. Would this work? What would happen? Actually, do it and see what happens. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Jono. Thank you, Letha. Jono, any closing thoughts from your side that you would like to offer? Uh, I was also wondering what a Gestalt Zoom session would be like. Yes. I, I, I have a little better, I have more experience of it. I don't know how, well, I don't know how Gestalt it was, but it felt like me and I felt like maybe I'm projecting, but I really, I chose to believe that people on the other end who I can't see were enjoying or connected or engaged or finding it useful. And I'm really, I tend to set the bar low on these things. If you've got one thing that was useful for you, I'm happy. And it was just a pleasure. And I really appreciate the invitation, Dorothy. Uh, so kind of you. And Andrea, thank you for your help. And everybody, just thanks. Just your being here feels like an acknowledgement. So that's, that's my gift for the day. I'm going to carry that with me for the day. Well, actually, you've made the day, I think, for all of us. And, and just the chat, you know, Harold says, well done. And, uh, you know, the question is, are the slides available? And the answer is yes, we'll be sending them out. And Jono's uh, PowerPoint, um, Paul said he has to go. Paula Wynn said that this has really been so helpful in expanding our reach. But I want to say to you, Jono, after all these years, it just never gets old listening to you. I think that one of the things that you really show us is that your being is an intervention and your wisdom, you know, uh, awareness is an inside job. So I think your willingness to show your interior to us and to make meaning and connect the dots to the complexity of the worlds that you've traveled and yet take the complexity and make it sound so simple is what your particular magic really is all about. And, you know, the great meditation master, uh, Sharon Salzman, says it's not when you drop the ball, it's the action you take next. And I think, Jono, from this moment, I really want to invite everybody in the next moment that as you reflect on this, you know, I love, Jono, hearing you say you reflect on everything. Because as you look so super cool in my 30 years of knowing you, you really do think a lot about these things on your inside. And I want to invite everybody to reach back to our dear Jono, and also, Jono, um, maybe we start, you know, a new kind of relationship where we do these webinars. And I want to say to everybody, Andrea, who joined me, was a gift. Andrea, thank you for making this one go so flawlessly. Jono, we said to ourselves, we cannot let any errors happen. <laughs> 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 so sometimes a little practice helps. Mm -hmm. I thank you for the time today. And I don't feel that we're finished. But I want to say in the classic Gestalt says is, let this be the start of wonderful unfinished business that brings us back together. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank everybody, you. for joining us. Thanks, Dorothy. Thank Thanks, thank Andrea. You. Thank all of you. Have a great day. You too. Have a great day. Sign on, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao, Zoltan. Hi, John. Hi, Deborah. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye, Jono. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye, bye, bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I think we're closing it now. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Oh, where can we go? Thank you. Bye, bye. Let's close bye -bye. the recording.